All right. Good morning, Shore Christian Church. If uh, you are new here, my name is Pastor Isaac. I'm the, uh, the lead pastor here, and you picked a, uh, a wonderful Sunday to uh, be a part of us and our church as we are closing this, this series that we've been in for the month of November, getting us ready for Thanksgiving. Who's excited for Thanksgiving? Who's excited to, to see family this Thanksgiving? Who's getting anxiety to, that you're going to have to see family this Thanksgiving? Yes. Okay, good. I, I pray that this will uh, set you free um, because it's going to be going to be a great close to this year. I'm so excited. Um, we, uh, we just announced this week, we're actually going to be having two services uh, at the Paramount Theater now. We're going to also be having a candlelight service at 5 p.m. Uh, that same Sunday evening, December 22nd. So uh, book that. If uh, you have some family coming in, you have two opportunities where you can invite them. Um, and so I want to get this sermon uh, and I'm glad that I got this microphone a little early because they're going to do something at the end of the service. I hope you have time for it, Rick. Uh, but I, last night, I, I feel like this, one of, one of, part of this sermon was one of the, the, the greatest revelations I feel like God gave me. And I just need some time to share it with you guys. Um, and I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 1. Um, and uh, this is the conclusion to the, the series. Consider the source. What is your source? Uh, where does it come from? Uh, where, don't forget where you came from is what we talked about last Sunday. And, and this Sunday, the title is going to be Don't Forget How It's Met. Uh, verse 28, Genesis chapter 1. And God blessed them. And uh, after he made Adam and, and Eve, he blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth. Subdue it. Rule over it. The fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves on the ground and then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of this whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, it is yours. And the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give to you. I give every green plant for food. And so it was. God gave us everything we need. He is our source, and Adam and Eve, they had everything that they needed, and it wasn't too long ago that uh, this new album came out. Um, it was uh, titled Jesus is King, and it was uh, composed by Kanye West. Has anybody heard any of the songs from it? Uh, it has been on, uh, on, on just constant, uh, um, just rewind in the Friedel household, and uh, Diamond, she was the first one to really get into it, and there was this one song that she really got into, and, and actually, um, I have to give part of the credit to this sermon to Diamond. Uh, she's the one that came up with the, uh, uh, the, the crux, the theme of it, um, and I stole it from her, from Pastor Diamond, and it, it actually came from one of the lyrics to this song, and if we could just take uh, uh, three minutes and just roll that, that song right now, that the title of the song is Everything We Need. That's, that's it. Put it back on the tree. Because we have everything we need. Put it back on. Because the reason you take it off the tree is because you don't think you have everything you need. And it, it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse, verse 2, it, it, it's here now. Uh, you have everything you need, Adam. They, they had it all. They, they were given everything that, that they needed by God, but it wasn't enough. And then the deceiver came and started questioning God, saying, did God really say that you cannot eat from this tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from any tree in the garden, but, but, but God put up a parameter and said that this one is, is off limits. We, we, we can't touch it. Verse 4, but the, 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 the deceiver began to question God. You will not certainly die, for the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. See, God all of a sudden was not enough. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes, she, and it was desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it and then gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And then one more verse of scripture, and then we'll get going with this sermon. Philippians chapter 4, uh, starting verse 16. This is Paul writing from prison, 
And he says, for even when I was in Thessalonia, you sent me more aid. For once when I was in need, he was in need, in need. That's what verse 16 says. I was in need and you sent aid to meet my need. And then he says, verse 19, for my God will meet all of my needs and all of your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I pray that you will minister to us, Father, through this message. Lord, give me the, the wisdom to be able to share this message in a way that will be able to set hearts free. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. So what do you need? We all have needs, don't we? Uh, even at a young age, my, my son Dewey, he, he has needs. My, my daughter Lily, she has so many needs. And, and it, it's funny, there, there are many times as we're raising our children and, and Lily, my daughter, she's the most emotional person in our family. And, and whenever things don't go her way, she, she breaks down and she cries and she screams. And, 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 and we try and tell her, Lily, it's not a big deal. It's, it, it, it's, it's, just a, uh, it's just a race that you lost to Judah. And, and, and yeah, you know, second is not first place. I'm sorry, Lily, you can't win at everything. And, and I'm, I'm sorry that you lost to Judah in, 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 in sorry. Uh, sorry, not sorry. The game's sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm kind of going down a rabbit trail here. Uh, and, and so whenever she goes through these, these panic attacks where she's freaking out and she's crying, we're, we're like, Lily, stop crying. I can't stop crying. And, and we're like, Lily, what do you want? She's like, I don't even know what I need. Anyone ever been there? Where you're, you're hurting, you're crying, you're upset, and, and like, quite frankly, I don't even know what I need because we don't even really know what we need. We know we have a need. We all have a need, Right? You got a need, I got a need, we all have a need, but a lot of times we don't even know how to fill that need. And a lot of times we come to church and we meet Jesus and, and all of a sudden we think that Jesus is going to take away our needs, but the, the, the truth of the matter is Christianity is not about uh, taking away our needs. Jesus is not about taking away our needs. He's about changing the way that we meet our needs. It's about, uh, I used to fill my needs a certain way, but now I found Jesus, and now I still have the hunger, but I just go to a different buffet to fill it. And that's our, our problem. See, th this is going to set somebody free, I pray. Your needs are normal. You're supposed to be needy. Every one of us are needy people. Our problem is we go to the wrong source to meet that need. That's where all of the dysfunction and problems come into our life is, is, is not the fact that, that we have a need, and that's the reason why we overspend, and that's the reason why we overmedicate, and that's the reason why we overdrink, and that's the, the source of, of every addiction, and that's the source of why we need so much approval in our life is because we think that some other person that is needy is going to fill my need, but that needy person has needs too, and we think that they're going to fill our needs, but the problem is that we're going to the the wrong well in order for our needs to be met. And that, that is why like, like something like loneliness, loneliness untreated turns to lust. Loneliness is a need that we all have. Man should not be alone, the Bible said. Loneliness is a need we all deal with. But when we don't deal with it the right way, that's when it turns into lust. That's when it turns into us going to the wrong well in order for our needs to be met. Jesus is not a need remover. He's a need meter. So how needy are you this morning? I mean, if, if there was like a barometer on your forehead, Bob, you know, where would that be reading? Like, how needy are you? And, and a lot of times, I don't know, you, only you know, because I can't tell you're smiling at me, but that doesn't mean you're not needy, you know, because like caffeine can make you happy. You know, I could drink a, cup, a, a, you know, a cup of coffee from Starbucks. I could be happy. But I could still be needy. You know, some people just have like a resting blessed face. You know, they're, they're, they're just, they're, it's just the way that they look, but that doesn't mean they're not needy. That doesn't mean deep down they're empty, they have no peace, they have no, no joy, but they, they, they just wear this, this beautiful face on them every day. You have a beautiful face, by the way, Bob. That's why I said that. You do have resting blessed face. I, I got to hand it to you, Bob. You, you, you win the award for that, but, but you still have needs. 
I have needs. We all have needs. So how do you fill those needs? Those needs for approval. Those needs to to, to feel good about yourself. How do you fill these desires, these needs that you have in your life when when you're all alone? What is your source? And, And that is the reason why we are so dysfunctional. Isn't because we're needy. It's because we are filling those needs the wrong way. And God is our source. God is our need meter. He's our need meter. But then, as we saw in in, in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, there's another that, that comes slivering into our lives, into my life, into your life. And his number one prerogative to destroy you and to bind you is to get you to believe that God is not enough. And once you begin to believe that God is not enough, then all of a sudden you have been deceived and all of the dysfunction in your life comes from that one problem. God is not enough. When the children of Israel were going into the promised land, God gave them 10 commandments. The first one was, thou shalt have no other gods before you, no other idols that are before God. And, and so often we get to a point where we have God and. We, we, we have God and, and, and our need for God isn't as strong as our need for other things. I just wrote down a, a few, and, and, and this is a lot of times the byproduct of that we see on the outside comes from a root of a need that we are meeting through the wrong source. When your need for money becomes greater than your need for God, then you will never be at peace. When your need for sex becomes greater than your need for God, you'll never feel loved. When your need for approval becomes greater than your need for God, you will always feel rejected and unloved. When your need for answers is greater than your need for God, you will always be confused. When your need for revenge is greater than your need for God, you'll always be angry and bitter. When your need for alcohol is greater than your need for God, you will always feel like something is missing. And Satan has you. Once he could get you to believe that God is not your need meter any longer, where I have to go to find my sense of of fulfillment and my sense of approval is outside of God then all of a sudden, I'm in chains and I don't even know it. It's one thing to be in chains. It's one thing to be in in a physical prison. You know where you are. But how about it when you're in chains and you don't even know it? You don't even realize what is happening in your life. And this has happened to so many people. And do you remember when it started to happen to you? Do you remember when God started to not be enough for you? You remember when you had to start going to a particular place to get your needs met? You remember when it started? And and it started real slow, and and it got you what you want, but then you got it, and you didn't like what you got. Anyone ever experienced that before? Where where, where you you got what you wanted, you went to that tree, and it, it was good, and it felt good, but then once you had it, you felt so empty because it didn't sustain you it couldn't last I remember when when I was uh, 12 years old uh, my mom's here it's good to see you here on in the first service mom and and my, my mom and I we were uh, walking our, our, our dog we don't have a dog anymore my wife made me send him to Delaware um, <clears throat> I'm still in recovery over that <laughs> uh, diamond and the dog didn't get along and so we, we, we got rid of the dog rather than diamond so um, you, you could appreciate that right uh, but when we did have a dog me and my mom used to take uh, uh, Silas was his name to, for walks on the beach and when we were on the beach remember when we saw that the, the lady from the paddle ball league we saw this lady from the paddle ball league if you don't know what paddle ball is it's like kind of like a, a small version of tennis that they play outdoors in like a cage and when I was like 10, 11 years old, me and my mom joined the paddle ball league. And I was, I was 
amazing at paddle ball. All right, I'll just be honest. I, I was an absolute stud at paddle ball. If there was a professional paddle ball league, I would be the number one contender. I was a total natural at paddle ball. I, I, I just dominated the court. My mom was on my team because we would play doubles, but, but my mom didn't really do much for our team except hit the ball into the net and, and whiff. But even when she whiffed, sometimes I'd be right behind her and I'd knock the ball over the net and we'd get the point. And at the end of the, the paddle ball league, they had this tournament. And the, the tournament was uh, all of the uh, uh, um, um, sons and, and their mothers or, or the people that joined the league together would compete two-on-two two in this league. And so remember this, Mom? Me and my mom were on a team together. And, and, and I, I was so super competitive that, that I, I was losing it on my mom. I mean, God did not bless my mom with athletic skills, and that's okay. You know, some of you, you got to know your lane and stay in your lane. And so my, my mom was, and I'm, 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 I'm angry. I'm like, I can't believe we're losing to them, mom. You got to step it up. Step up your game, Pastor Rhonda. You know, you, you got to, you know, follow through and stop hitting. It. You're playing scared, mom. Come on. Take the skirt off. Let's go. You know, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated with my mom. And then one of the other boys, uh, he, he got sick and had to go home. And so his mother became a free agent. And so halfway through the paddle ball tournament, I, if you, <laughs> I, I left, I, I'm, I, mom, am I, am, I, am I serious right now? Oh, yeah. I left my mom, and I joined this other mom, and we dominated the Atlanta Club Battle Ball League, and we took home the championship trophy. <laughs> I got what I wanted, but... At the end of the day, I didn't really like how I got it. And, and I know that's kind of a silly, weird analogy. And please, I've, I've matured some since then, but I may still leave my mom if there's a trophy on the line. I'm not sure, you know. <laughs> just kidding, mom. I'm just kidding. But, but, and this is funny because my mom was probably happy that I left her team because I'm such a psych, psych, psycho on the, on the court. She was probably happy that I wasn't her teammate anymore. But, but the point is, is, is a lot of times we have a need and we go to the wrong source, a wrong way to meet that need, and we get it filled, but we don't like ourselves even after we get the need filled because of what we had to do to get it. Am I the only one who's ever gone through that and... And every single one of us, we have needs. We can't choose our needs. We just have them. Every day we have needs. Needs in our marriage, needs in our body, needs in our desires. We have all these needs that are, are raging. And we don't get to choose our needs, but we get to choose how we meet those needs. There's always a choice. Say choice. You always have a choice. You have the power to choose how you are going to meet that need. You don't choose what your needs are. Yes, there are some things in this, in this life we don't get to choose. You don't get to choose the, the family that you're born into. You don't get to choose some of the things that you went through maybe as a child or maybe, maybe even today. But you always get to choose how you will respond to that, that, that environment that you were born into. You, you always get to choose how you will respond to that evil that takes place in your life. Nobody can take that choice away from you. You always have the power to choose. And I'm so thankful for that, that God gave me the ability to choose whatever I want. And you have the power to ch make choices. But here's the key. Your choices have the power to make you. Say that one more time. You have the power to make choices, but your choices have the power to make you. You are who you are today because of the choices that you have made. And you could go on blaming everybody, and you could blame your environment, but, but, but I found that no matter what environment anyone was ever born into, I could find at least one example of somebody who came out of that environment blessed, and came out of that environment victorious, and came out of that environment being able to raise a healthy family, even though they didn't have a healthy family that raised them. There's always somebody. You are not a victim to your environment. You could always choose how to respond to whatever situation you are in. And I'll say this, that does not shape your destiny. 
what was done to you, the family that you were born into, the struggles that you've been through in your past does not have the power to shape your destiny. What has the power to shape your destiny is how you choose to respond to what was done to you and the struggles that you've been through. So how will you respond? Your choices will always make you who you are. And it always starts out as a choice. I, I need a, a volunteer. John, you, you get up here. You, you're dressed real nice and you're closest to the stairs. So uh, you're, you're, just, you're just dying to get up here. And all, all of us at, at, a, at a young age started making choices. Some of us, we made bad choices. And you, you have certain needs, right, John? You, you, are you a needy person? Always. Always a good man, very obedient. I told them to say that. <laughs> and, and, and you get to choose how you're going to meet those needs. And it starts off with, with just a choice. And I'll, I'll use an example where, where, where maybe you have a... Uh, um, a need where you feel lonely, and, and, and you get to choose how you're going to meet that. You, you, you are going to choose how you're going to deal with this insecurity in, in your heart, so you choose to, let's just say, uh, I'm going to use it as an example, start, start to drink, start to over-medicate yourself. It starts off as a choice because you have this need, and so you choose to, to go to the wrong source to meet that need. And so, John, you're going to take that and you're going to put that right on your belt buckle right there because that's your choice. I have a need, and I don't think God's enough to meet that need, so I, I choose to go to the tree. But every choice doesn't just stay a choice because the next time that need comes up, you go back to the same tree. And you have to go back to that, that tree again. And, and you have to go back to that tree again because now the need comes back because what I used to fill that need. And, and it's so easy to talk about like drugs and sex for this and drinking. Those are the easy things. But, 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 but how about the, the fact that your mouth probably does more damage than any alcoholic in this church? And we love picking on the alcoholics and the drug addicts and the, the, the people that have uh, issues with pornography and all these things. But, but how about your mouth, sir, ma'am, does more damage. It would be better off if you were an alcoholic. And I'm, I'm being, you know, not serious, but, but kind of serious at the same time. Because your mouth does so much damage to other people, how you talk about people, how you tear people down. And it started as a choice because you, 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 you began to say something about somebody else and it kind of made you feel good and it started off as a choice, John. But choices become habits. And now it's, it's not just a choice, now it's a habit. Now, now every time that need comes up inside of me, I used to just get, get angry, and I, I used to get angry, and it would get me what I wanted. It would get me the attention that I want, but now I can't even control my anger. It's like my, my, my mechanism. It's like a habit. Whenever anything goes or doesn't go the way I expected it to, I, I just shoot my mouth off at somebody. It's a habit, and then it goes from a habit to being what, what I thought automatic. It's just my default setting now, Joe. Where, where I don't even know any other way. It's just automatic. I, I, I automatically just complain about everything. You know, I used to actually have reason to why I complain, John. But now, if there's uh, anything wrong in the room, I just start complaining. I can't even talk to a person without finding a fault in that person to complain about. I, I can't even go through a day without worrying. It's, it's like my automatic mechanism when I'm by myself in my car. I just start worrying about what might go wrong. It's automatic, and then it becomes your identity. This is, this is just who I am now. I'm a worrier. And it goes from being your identity to this is my nature. There's no other way for me to meet my needs other than to go to this well. And it's mine. And then this is what we say. When it becomes our nature, we start saying, I've always been this way. I was born this way. I'll never change. 
this is just who I am. This is what I do to meet my needs. And then what happens is, is all of a sudden, this is what happens. You get chained to that tree. I'm not trying to get fresh with you, John. Why don't you put that on your belt? I don't want to make you uncomfortable. But now, everywhere you go, you have to carry that tree with you. Every relationship you go into, you have to carry that tree with you. You could run, but you can't hide because your needs will never go away. You wake up tomorrow, your needs are there. Your emotional needs, your spiritual needs, they're there. And you have gotten so used to having your needs met a certain way that you cannot get away from it any longer. It started out as a choice, but now it's your chain. And now, John, you, you, you want to get married, and, and you go and you get married. But when you get married, guess what comes with you? That tree comes with you. And we wonder why so often people can't be intimate in a marriage is because they're so used to having their needs met a certain way that when they get into the marriage, they can't have their needs met by their spouse because this is the way I get my needs met. It's been like that for so long. You get into a new relationship, you get into a new job, and all of a sudden, you just complain about everything because the only way you could ever get your needs met is to find out what's wrong with everybody else to make you feel good about yourself. You got this tree every single place you go. You can't get away from this tree. It's with you every single step of the way. That's our problem. I take your silence as the fact that I'm speaking to your heart this morning. Because every one of us can relate to this. And we come into church and we, we, we pray a prayer and we sing songs and, and our problem is we say, God, take away my needs. I don't want to feel this way any longer. God's like, no. If I took away your needs, you wouldn't need me. I'm not going to take away your needs. You're still going to have the same needs when you leave this building. But what I want to do is I want to be your need meter. I want to take the place of that tree so you can put it back on the tree. You, you don't have to be chained to that tree any longer. And so often, because we don't think God is enough, we, we, we put other idols ahead of him. We don't think God can meet our needs. We don't think God is enough for us, so we go to the wrong well. There's a story in John chapter 4 with a woman who had needs. I, I would say she probably had, she probably had uh, lust needs. She had approval needs. She had all, all, all these needs because she was married to five other men. And now she's living with another man. She, she had a need to, to have a companion. She couldn't be alone. Her loneliness turned to lust. Because she didn't know how to, how to go to the right source to meet her need. But then she came face to face with the source, Jesus Christ. And, and this is what Jesus said to her. Jesus said to her, I, I have water. I have a tree. I, I have food. I, I, have, I, I have a resource that I want to give you where you will never have to thirst again. You don't have to go to this well any longer. And she says, I want some of that water. And Jesus said, I am he. And see, we always sing songs that Jesus is a chain breaker. Who likes that, that, that song? Yeah. We sing that song. Break every chain. Break every chain. I hear those chains falling. Who, who, who. And we, sh we shout over that. And I don't mean to throw rain on that song. But I think it's inaccurate. Because Jesus didn't come to break chains. 
He doesn't want to break your chains. He wants to change your chains. See, when you say, God, you are my source. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Lord, you you are it. Then all of a sudden, you're not chained to the tree any longer, but you're chained to Christ. And see, you still have the need. I still have the need, but now I also have a need meter. And this is what I love about my need meter, is everywhere I go, John, go somewhere. I, I, I got my need meter that goes with me. I can't get away from him. David says, surely goodness and mercy and provision shall follow me all of the days of my life. The only thing stronger than the chain of sin is the chain of grace. Grace is stronger. And you need to say, I am going to put my faith in the need meter and chain myself to him. I'm not going to keep going back to the same tree any longer because I know where that's going to lead me. It's going to lead to destruction. It's going to destroy my marriage. It's going to destroy my relationships. It's going to destroy how I think of myself, but if I'm chained to Christ, all of a sudden he becomes my need meter, and nobody knows what I need more than the one who made me. The one who put that need inside of me is the only one that knows how to fill it. When is God going to be enough for you? When you come to that revelation, and it takes surrender. Nobody wants to surrender. Finally, what is it going to take for you to unhook yourself from that need tree? Where it's always him that has to meet my need or her that has to meet my need or that or, or, or this amount of money or this shopping spree or whatever your need meter, your tree is. When is God going to be enough? And I'm not saying that those things are are, are, are bad, yes, we have needs, we gotta eat, we gotta, you know, it's okay to, to, to buy something, but that is not what fills my need. God is my only need meter. And when you come to that place of surrender, then you can finally have peace and joy. That's not just a resting blessed face, but it's a resting blessed heart, where my heart can be at rest finally. Put it back on the tree and chain yourself to Christ. Thank you, John. And before I I, I turn this sermon over, I I feel a, a need to pray for you this morning. Because I know that there are some frustrated people out there. And that's your source right there. Everywhere you go, you have to bring that tree with you. Because it's been so long. And you're so used to having your needs met a certain way. And it starts with surrender. Saying, God, I'm going to surrender to you. From this day on, I'm not going to be perfect. I'm still going to make mistakes, I'm sure. But I'm always going to come back to the right source. That you are forever going to be my only source, my only need meter. I'm not going to rely on him or her or it any longer to meet my needs. I am giving you your job back. And when you do that, you will be chained to Christ forever. Let's bow our heads. Father, God, we thank you so much that you came for us, that you came to our rescue, God. God, forgive us for going to the wrong well. Forgive us for allowing our our needs to be above you and going to people to meet our spiritual needs and our, our empty souls, God. God, this morning, we're not asking you to 
take away our chains. But this morning we are, we are asking you to disconnect our chains from that tree and chain you to our hearts. When you put it back on the tree, you will finally be free. Put it back on the tree this morning. Stop going to that drug. Stop going to that glass. Stop going to that well. Stop going to the way you treat other people. Stop going to success to, to meet your needs. Never work. And you're going to hurt so many people along the way. You think if you get justice, if you inflict vengeance on the person who hurt you, you think that's going to meet your need. It's only going to open more an already gaping wound in your heart. But when you choose Christ, say, Jesus, you come above all else, putting you on the throne of my heart. It breaks my heart knowing that there's so many people that have been in church for so long and they're still chained to that tree. It doesn't mean you're not going to heaven. It just means that you're going to have to go through hell while you're down here on earth because you're going to the wrong source. God wants you to have abundant life now where you could be like Paul in prison and with more joy than somebody who's sitting in a palace because he knows that my God shall supply all my needs. There's such a peace that comes with that. God, I pray that we could have that peace. God, I pray for the hearts that were ministered to this morning. That when they get in their cars and they go home, that this message will stick inside of them. Throughout Thanksgiving and throughout the holidays, and we could go into 2020 saying, God, you are my only need meter. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand clap.